we're trying to support those that are supporting others because we have to. There's not a choice in it because we all see the numbers. Everyone's leaving the job. There's no one to replace them. And that's something that I try and get across to some of the admins. I've talked to city councils and county councils. It's like, look, I understand your your concern with liability, but there's also two sides of liability. There's doing too much and there's not doing enough. And these dogs are going to have less of a liability than your narcotics dog or your uh, obviously, you know, patrol dog. But why not? put a good foot forward to show your people in a physical thing that you care about them. Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference April 23rd through the 28th, 2023 at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. It's going to be a great experience. Five career-changing days. Some of the most profound speakers in the industry. Guest speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Congressional Medal of Honor winner, Fox News host Tommy Lahren, Navy SEAL American war hero Jason Redman, Sheriff David Clark, Sheriff Mark Lamb, and Sheriff Wayne Ivey. You'll also spend time with all of our Street Cop instructors at this event Monday through Friday. We'll have a great lineup of courses in addition to our great speakers. It will be a week that you will not forget. You'll be thankful you came. You don't want to miss out. Check out streetcop.com on how to register. If you're going to use the room code, make sure you book it from Sunday through Friday. That's what the code's good for, and it's about half the price of the regular rate. But those rooms are running out, so make sure you sign up now. We'll see you there. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benito. I have with me today, Janine Baguette. I bet you I said that right. You did say it right. Awesome. I, I tell people it's either the diamond or the bread. That's how you pronounce it. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'll let Janine explain who she is. She's got a canine foundation. Really cool shit. And we're happy to have you here today. Thank you for doing the podcast. Appreciate it. Oh, Trends. thank you. I, I very much appreciate it. I have to admit I was a bit nervous about uh, about doing it, but um, here we go. Um, so, yes, I am uh, Janine Baguette. I'm the uh, chairman and founder of Canines for Freedom and Independence. And what we do is we take dogs that we have either rescued or have been donated to us, and we turn them into critical incident response team canines. They go to different first responder agencies as another specialty canine and are deployed in any kind of use that they need, whether or not it's internal or external for their community. So they can be used for peer support meetings, for critical incident, if it's a natural disaster, if it's um, an officer involved shooting, if it's coffee with a cop, because these are dogs that people can pet. They're purposely meant for um, you know, people to love on, pet, and whatnot. They're not just therapy dogs. They are specifically trained to do a multitask of things. And we actually teach them to pick up and be attracted to the chemical and hormone changes of individuals under stress. And we teach them to draw us to them by pulling us to it, similar to like a detection dog. So they're taught an odor. And once they're in their working collar, then they know that they can then pull us towards the odor that they're smelling. Um, The thing that we are doing that is different is number one, they are actually canines. So they do fall under FLSA. They um, have a national certification that we have come up with, with an organization called ARI. Um, And it, it basically just makes it so there's no extra thinking for administration to go, well, I don't know. And, you know, whatever their excuse might be, I'm trying to negate that by making it everything that any other type of specialty canine is, this dog is too in their own specialty. So that's how we do it. We donate the dogs. We donate the training. The only thing that we ask for is $1,500 to cover our expenses of delivering the dog and all of the medical and food that we may have put into them during the time that we've had them. And for that amount of money, that's nothing for yes, most any agency. Sounds like you guys are pretty much a nonprofit, right? Yes, it is a nonprofit. Um, we are a 501c3 under the IRS as well as the state of Texas. 
So we gained that back in 2012. And this year, we have a total of, uh, off the top of my head, probably about 15, 15 to 20 dogs at a multitude of agencies uh, across the country. Uh, right now, we've got quite a few. I think we've got seven or eight in the Kansas City Metroplex. We've got going to be four, no, five in Oklahoma. Uh, and we will have six here in Texas, and I will soon be placing the next dog in the lovely state of New York. So we just got uh, our application for Monroe County Sheriff's Department. They want a dog, and so we're dealing with their wellness unit. Um, the reason that we call them critical incident dogs is we're taking the, the stigma of therapy out of it. We're taking, um, because most cops with, you know, whether or not you're talking guys or girls are, are, are into acronyms. So we call it a CERT canine, C-I-R-T canine, and it's the K number nine. And they can do a menagerie of things. There is a, a great uh, doctoral dissertation out from a deputy out of Florida. Uh, I think you've had him on your podcast and I'm doing a brain fart of his name right now, but they uh, have used them in interviewing of victims. And these dogs are used for that as well. Mm. Um, and then the amount of information that is gotten from them, from the victim with the dog present is exponentially higher than just interviewing them between the investigator and the uh, victim. So there's a whole lot of things that they're being used for. We've had our dogs used in uh, a, a young teenager that was um, attempting to cut herself and commit suicide, but she was cutting herself. The The officer, which is uh, Overland Park, Kansas, um, used his dog and his training and experience to get her to stop what she was doing and voluntarily go in for care versus having to go hands-on. We've had other incidents where there's been an individual, a child, in fact, that was attempted strangulation by a family member, and they have to go in and get all the photos. That's super scary to a child that's approximately five years old. Mm. And they were able to use that dog um, to distract the child, and the dog remains calm. They can get in there and get the photos, and in fact, what ended up happening is the only time the dog ended up having to leave is when they were doing the ultraviolet uh, photos. Well, dogs' eyes aren't protected from that. And so between the different agencies, they decided to go out and purchase specific doggles, and they do call them doggles, to protect the dog's eyes. So for the next time, the dog won't have to leave at all. So you're, a, you're an angel. I, I, I'm trying to do what I can. Uh, I'm a combat veteran myself. Uh, I was uh, in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I was an um, aerovac medic. And so we got to see a lot of uh, craziness. I remember several times jumping off of the uh, the back end of a 141 because we had somebody um, going into cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, different things that we had to do there, being bombed while we're trying to uh, evacuate our patients. There's a lot of stuff uh, that I've done, and this is what I see as a future in trying to help using my love of animals because I'm a canine handler for my agency. Uh, I run both a bomb dog and a narcotics dog. And being a dog lover, a dog handler, a dog trainer, this is how I can do what I do to help others, knowing that this field is just I mean, I'll just say it. It's obnoxiously toxic. It, typically, they pile on when they see the weakest link. Instead of trying to support that person and bring them up, they pile on, you know, literally a dog pile. And, you know, they do what they can to, to get rid of the person. I had two of my guys, because we originally started doing handicap service dogs for post-traumatic stress and uh, traumatic brain injuries. And we did, went a different direction because I wanted to use these dogs to help even more people than just one person, one dog. And two of my guys were in specialty units where they went to their administration and said, hey, 
I can't, I can't do this anymore. Just put me back out on the road, put me back in a uniform and put me back out on the road because I just can't keep watching, you know, these videos and these photos and these, you know, and they found a way to fire him. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so what ended up happening, they, of course, luckily for them had good attorneys, went back and fought it and got medical retirements out of it. But still that's, that's the mentality still that's in this career field. And it's sad. It's obnoxious. It's, I mean, every, everything you can say that's, that's negative. I mean, we're human, we're going to make mistakes. Um, but to crucify someone for every little thing makes absolutely no sense. So I have this dream of like bringing every horrible police administrator into like a stadium and one by one, just putting them on trial of like, why did you behave this way? Why did you act that way towards this person? Yeah. What were you doing when you were setting them up to be fired? What was the, what, what was the point where you thinking about their family when you just, you know, essentially handed down discipline and threw away the key? What were, what were your thoughts with that? You've never done anything like that yourself, right? That's what you're saying. You, you were flawless through this career. And, and all of a sudden now, because you're uh, on the higher echelon of, the quote unquote law enforcement totem pole in your right. little subculture world, your little biodome of people. People don't realize like at right. these police agencies, like you're like my captain, like you're like, Oh my God, it's captain. So-and-so like captain. So-and-so is a fucking nobody in real life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but in, yeah, yeah. but in your, in your little, like, I'm not saying there are nobody in real life, but like, right. so is Dennis Benito. I'm a nobody in fucking real life. I, 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 as you really start to understand this stuff. So your, your captain, albeit maybe a great person, which is great, or a lieutenant or a sergeant or your coworkers or your chief, whoever it may be, maybe a great right. person. That's great. But outside the walls of that building, they're just a regular person. So we kind of put these people on like these, these platforms where based on their rank, but not on the things they've done, we give them this ultimate power. Me, I'm like, y'all tell me what you've done and I'll respect the shit out of you and tell me who you are. Right. Like, what have you done? Hey, I'm the captain that fought for these guys to get this. I'm the lieutenant that wanted new co- gun racks and cars. And I, hey, man, that's the guy we want. Like, we should right. be worshiping a guy like you. You took this position. You did the right thing with it. Tell me about the name of the guy or girl who is in the same rank that did everything they can to make this thing worse and just misbehaved constantly and got away with it because they could. And that's and that's why a lot of people are. You know, sometimes you're like, oh, you know, you have a lot to say about administrations. I have a lot to say about great administrations. Thank God you all exist. I have wonderful relationships with with sheriffs and chiefs and and legislators and 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 politicians throughout this country. Right. Really good relationships with them because they behave appropriately. It's the ones that I don't that I don't think behave properly, which is human behavior. It's not even it has nothing to do with the law enforcement side of it. Like you're a fucking asshole. So yeah. why are we going to pander to you because you're not going to send three guys to training next year because we say that you should be nice to people and be compassionate and have humanity. Like, I don't fucking care. Right. I mean, like, and it just goes to show further of like now these men and women don't get training because of your personal feelings. And the, the bottom line is the problems lie within you. You can decide to get better and do better. We can all be better as human beings to each other. We can all be better as bosses and coworkers and, and subordinates. So let's work at that instead of trying to really fuck people over. Right. No, no. And, and, and that's just it. You always have to strive to learn because the minute you think, you know, it all is the time for you to leave. Oh yeah. And every time I've taken several, several um, classes from street cop, I've paid for them. I'm not going to go through my agency to do it because it's just easier to, to just do it myself. And I'm investing in myself. What class were you at? I forgot. Um, I went to Tom's class twice and one in Oklahoma City. And then last time he was uh, here last year in uh, DFW. I just went to another one that was here um, in uh, Fort Worth. Was it um, Rios's NARC class? Was it Mike Vaccaro uh, map training? What was it about? What was the premise of the class? It was the uh, uh, human behavior. Oh, Sean Grogan. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. So, John's, a, John's a dog guy. Did you, did you connect with him? Yes. Well, yeah, we talked. We talked a little bit, but, you know, obviously he's busy. So, um, but yeah, no, super good class. I love going to the classes. Um, I love going and getting that information, but I'm a hands-on learner. So classroom stuff is great. It gives you that basic knowledge, but I'm one that's got to go out and do it. So a lot of us 
in the, in the field that, that I'm in, we've actually teamed up and I've heard you talk in, uh, in the past on some of your podcasts that it's not about me against you. It's about all of us doing what we can to support each other, to drive whatever your topic is forward. And so there are several women, uh, very strong women that I work with that um, are doing amazing things in the same realm and we've all teamed up. And so um, uh, Officer Monica Williams is with CBP. She has a program that she's tried to start under CBP because God knows they need help. They're just, yeah, it, it's horrible. They're wonderful, wonderful officers, wonderful, you know, uh, boots on the ground people. But we we can see on a daily basis how, how badly they're being treated. And then uh, Dr. Kobe Webb, um, she is actually retired captain from Riverside County Sheriff's Department. They just lost she, the uh, police officer yesterday. Yes, uh, exactly. Like that's terrible. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the three of us have teamed up and we're actually going to be putting together a national association. We haven't uh, figured out quite the name yet, but National Association of Critical Incident Support Canines. It's going to be all about these kind of dogs, the training and education. Uh, another colleague of mine that's local that also has one of my dogs, Christina O'Rear, and she's actually a detective for uh, Grapevine PD. And she started Blue Line SISM, and she's doing a bunch of training for law enforcement, for, you know, peer support and whatnot. And so the whole reason that we're going through some of the stuff that we're doing is, as you well know, because it was brought up in, in that last class about people trying to infiltrate, is that you've got very well-intentioned, probably, people wanting to come and bring their dogs and be there for some mass casualty type of situation. And for a couple of reasons, it's not appropriate. Other than you don't have the training and expertise on how to deal with it. You don't have the background check to know who the hell you are and what information are you gonna hear? And then all of us are getting the training or already have the training for peer support, critical incident, hostage negotiators, things like that. Where, where is this information gonna go? Is it just gonna stay within the four walls that you're at? Or is it then gonna be taken out to the media, told to your friends, yada, yada, yada. I mean, we had several handlers. Monica was one that went down to Uvalde and she said it, it was an absolute shit show in regards to people that showed up because they were just wanting the limelight. And, you know, who who of these individuals that are going claiming that they have a therapy dog, which aren't specifically trained to do this work, are going to hear something that's either going to traumatize them as an individual, because you know how sick we can be. But then two, who are they and where's that information going to go from here? Is it going to go on the outside? Is it then going to get turned around? And so these are some of the things that the the three of us and then Christina being the fourth are trying to mitigate to make sure that whatever we hear or see cannot be used in either a legal function or even an administrative function. Because if you know, you know as well as I do, they'll try and bring you up on some sort of admin charge uh, if they can't get you on you know, a legal charge because something, you know, something is being brought up against you. And so that's really why all of us are working together, trying to make this happen. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. Our first conference was uh, this year in, um, in uh, May. And then next year's conference is going to be October 9th through the 13th. It'll be back up in Kansas City. Uh, we actually have arrangements that have it at the actual international airport. And we take these dogs, their handlers that come, if their administrators want to come, we welcome it. We want them to understand all the training that these dogs are going through and the certification. And we go out and we do different environmental training at different places. Last year, we went to a working Amazon warehouse where all this stuff was going on. And we went and they had volunteers from Amazon to walk us through different places so the dogs could get used to their robots and the forklifts and the different things that are going on. We went to, and we're going to be going to again next year, is the Chinook helicopter hangar there on the Army National Guard base. And it's just getting used to different environments, different places, different things, so we can make the abnormal 
normal to these dogs because we're not going to a hospital room where there's one or two people. We're going out into the field. It could be at an actual crime scene where we're right outside the tape and an investigator needs to come out and get something out of the car and they can take a minute and get an endorphin dump, love on the dog for a minute, and the dog is completely calm and and used to being in all these different environments and they're not adding to the stress of the person. Mm. And that's that's really the big thing is these dogs have to be so specifically trained to want to involve themselves in other people, being used to being around large groups of people or a chaotic situation and remain calm and focused on their job. So it's very similar to any other type of detection dog where they have to omit their environment and and work on what we've trained them to do. Um, Just recently, uh, I've got two dogs at Fort Worth PD and just recently we took, and I, you'll, you'll probably chuckle when I say this, but we took the opportunity on their Red Man Day. Yeah. And we exposed the dogs to the people prior and after doing that fight, just so they could start to feel that anxiety, that uh, nervousness, whatever they might be feeling prior to and then the dump after and just to start you know involving that and luckily we've got an academy now that's willing to let us do that and we've all become a big family whether or not you're talking Kansas Oklahoma or Texas New York's going to get added to it we're all there to try and help each other out if it's hey I had this happen what do you you know have what have you had done you know what's happened to you when something like this has happened. What did you do? We've got a um, specific uh, Facebook group only for the critical incident handlers and trainers. And they can ask questions on there about, well, what if this, or this is what's going on or whatever. We're trying to support those that are supporting others because we have to, there's not a choice in it because we all see the numbers. Everyone's leaving the job. There's no one to replace them. And that's something that I try and get across to some of the admins. I've talked to city councils and county councils. It's like, look, I understand your your concern with liability, but there's also two sides of liability. There's doing too much and there's not doing enough. And these dogs are going to have less of a liability than your narcotics dog or your uh, obviously, you know, patrol dog. But why not? put a good foot forward to show your people in a physical thing that you care about them, that you're concerned with their welfare, that you understand what they're going through to even a certain extent. And typically they all, they all buy in on it. Sometimes it takes a little bit, but there's been a few that um, because of their administrative process, it takes forever, but I'm doing what I can Kobe's doing what she can because actually we work hand in hand. One of the agencies, in fact, it's Oklahoma City PD. I have two of my dogs there. Kobe has one of her dogs there. I monitor her dog as well because I'm closer. If I had a dog near her, Kobe would monitor my dog. And so, you know, it's a team effort. We're all there to try and help each other out. Um, good, bad, or ugly. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast, and it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally, and we also entertain you as well. I mean, it seems like a great resource. How about this? Um, tell me more about you. Tell me about your history, uh, what you do now. If you're, I don't know if you're allowed to name your agency. Uh, you don't have to. And, you know your your history with dogs, and and I'd like to hear about your war history as well, and all that shit. I think you seem like a very interesting person, um, and I think everybody it, else would want to hear about it as well. Um, it, it's it's been it's been interesting. I actually joined the military due to um, a uh, rough childhood. It was a way to escape. And when I joined, I spent nine years in, 
uh, part of it reserve, part of it active duty. I actually traveled more in the reserve than I ever did active duty. Part of you know some of the work that I did, I was an Arabic medic, which basically meant I was an enlisted uh, nurse that we cared for patients while we were flying from one location to another. I got that phone call when I was at work because I, due to my military training, I was able to get my nursing license um, because I am originally from California. Don't hold it against me. I left as soon as I could. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Working as a nurse, I got that phone call that we all dread to get that you're being activated and you're being sent overseas. And, you know, spent uh, some time over in the desert. I was in country. I was actually in Saudi Arabia. Uh, just south of the Iraqi border. So we got a lot of craziness uh, at our base. And we flew missions from Saudi Arabia into Germany and um, saw some things that, you know, you don't necessarily want to see or you'll never see here um, in in the U.S. Got out of uh, the military joined, uh, started going into law enforcement, spent some time in corrections, spent some time with the federal um, law enforcement. I worked for uh, Department of Defense as a police officer, did a lot of um, anti-terrorism type stuff, moved here to uh, to Texas and got into to local law enforcement. And so I work now for an agency, a sheriff's department here in uh, Texas, And for them, I'm a uh, canine handler, both a narcotics dog handler and a bomb dog handler. Well, first off, thank you for your service, not only overseas and for this country, but even now continuing to do your part. Uh, You've had quite an extensive career. Are you still doing stuff in the medical field as well? I am on a uh, deployment team for the federal government. It's a DMORT team. And I actually deployed to New York um, during Hurricane Sandy and was there for two weeks. I'm still on a team for the federal government, but I'm now on a, um, it's a mortuary team. So they use us for photographing uh, evidence and things uh, that they find during whatever event that we're there for. So I use it in that aspect. Um, Otherwise, I'm more on the law enforcement realm. Unfortunately, when I moved to um, Texas, they wouldn't acknowledge my nursing license uh, because I wasn't trained in a brick and mortar building. And they wouldn't acknowledge my federal law enforcement training. So I had to go back through an academy. So uh, if you count my basic training for the military, I've been through four. So yeah, it's it's been, uh, so I've got a broken body, three right knee surgeries, uh, right shoulder. Listen, I get it. Um, if it makes you feel any better, I'm not trying to compare and contrast. No. Uh, three police. Everybody's well aware I did three police academies. They used to call me the professional recruit. That was my yes. name, my third one. Like, oh, the professional recruits here. This guy just loves police academies. Like, I fucking hate. Oh, I and you know him. what it comes down to? I always tell people I write an autobiography. It's going to be called Willing. I was just willing to do what I had to do yeah. to get where I wanted to be, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, th- and that's what you've got to do. And so, yeah, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now is, um, you know, there's a, there's a need. I didn't see anyone doing it. I thought I could help. And uh, so I'm making it happen. How effective are these dogs essentially when we start implementing them in these agencies and why do people go for a dog do they do it before or after a critical incident are they preparing you know why what makes an agency there's a lot of questions here but what makes an yeah. agency uh eager or want to get one of these service dogs versus one who doesn't i think it's typically a push by an individual every time that an agency has reached out to me it's been because of an individual can see the need Um, I recently just got a phone call from the FBI and they're interested in getting a dog. They're interested. They then have to get buy-in by their administration. Most of them can see once I, you know, I email them everything that I've got articles and, um, dissertations. Kobe's got a, a great dissertation on law enforcement stressors. The, uh, the other dissertation that I have on using these dogs for uh, victim interviews. And so what I do, if if they want me to talk to their administrator or, you know, come and visit with them, as I explain to them, it's, it's not just touchy-feely. When you get into it, 
And it's a, a way of allowing a person to bring down their guard, which then with the endorphin dump and the hormone dump, it then allows the mouth to speak. Because sometimes when you're in that high stress situation, you don't have the ability to speak or express yourself. And the first, um, the first thing you need to do to start healing is to talk about it. And that's whether or not you're a victim of a crime or you're a first responder who's been through something that has really, um, you know, not broken them, but has, has gotten to them. And these dogs can do that. And it's not a whole lot of effort on their part to get this done. It's just a matter of an SOP. Um, and typically there's um, ways to, they, they typically have a vehicle that they can outfit with a crate. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a full canine insert. It doesn't have to be, you know, all that, unless they want to. And some of the agencies have. They have gone full tilt, full canine, you know, brand new vehicles for these dogs. Hey, okay, this is great. Um, and we've had administrators that have gone with some of our handlers once they've gotten their dogs. And they go to these different agencies and they see the difference between walking in the door and you see a bunch of people because one of their officers was shot and killed and they walk into this room that's super heavy with emotion. And then Gus walks through the door and he's a big old Labrador, big old black Labrador. And you can see people getting down on the ground, loving on this dog. Sometimes they even start bawling and they're letting it out. Um, and these dogs are specifically trained to be very well receptive to full body contact. And it's just it's it's just a out of the box way of getting someone to maybe even contemplate, mm, maybe I do need help. Maybe I need to go to a therapist. Maybe I need to go to a counselor. And maybe it's just that little piece that gets them to think about. I need some help. So it's just the start. It's not the solution, but it's the start of getting that person healthy. Because if you think about it, that's why a lot of these people are leaving because they're not healthy. They're not getting help from their agencies. Things are falling um, apart at home. If things are falling apart at home, then things fall apart at work. It's a, a vicious cycle and it, it just, it, it makes, for me, it makes complete sense to do something this, I call it small, to then keep that person from walking away. And if we're lucky, they're just quitting and they're taking all of their experience with them, which you can't put a dollar sign on. And then two, Worse yet, maybe they commit suicide. And we don't want that either because then that then transcends across the department as well. And if you can do that, look at how much money you're saving. So if you put it in dollars and cents, and that's typically where I go with administrators, here's dollars and cents. How much money? Do you have to pay for a background investigator to do a background on an individual? How much money are you paying? Do you do you pay for this person to go through the academy? Do they pay for the academy itself? Then you have to outfit them. Then you have to do all these different things. That's all costing you money. Wouldn't it just be easier to maintain and help the people that you have? And and unfortunately, that's where it has to go with some administrators because they don't see what some people call the fluff side, the feel good side. So. So if there's an emergency, something significant happens, maybe a, a line of duty death, 
Are you guys available to deploy a dog to that agency or how does that work? Typically, they're all helping out each other's agencies in their local area. So we've had several uh, officer-involved shootings up in the Kansas City Metroplex. We've got six dogs up there, I think, right now. Yes. Um, and they all communicate together. It's like, hey, and, and we've had it happen. Hey, I need you on this date to go here. I need somebody to go over here. And they'll have a dog at multiple locations on the same day. So maybe it's the funeral home. It's the hospital. It's the family's home. Maybe it's you know, whatever the, at the department. And everyone is helping out because not one dog can do it all. But then, too, not one handler can handle all of that stress. And so, yes, we do. We do work as a team, whether or not it be local or outside. We are working on trying to get. um, And we're going to be doing it statewide, I think, initially. um, That if there is an event that law enforcement needs the dogs within or fire, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're talking any first responder agency, but normally it's it's law enforcement that we're working on getting on some sort of state deployment team. So that state can reimburse the agency for their person being gone. So that's some of the stuff that we're working on as well. Um, but obviously that's that's going to take a little bit. If someone wants to help join in, get started, one, how did they get started? But two, what's the breakdown in the process? Process, I've made it super simple in regards to how do you get a dog. It's a letter on letterhead from one of your upper management, upper upper leadership, that um, we're interested in getting a dog through your program. And, and we are completely, you know, in uh, however they want to word it, um, we are on board and willing to pay the $1,500 to get a dog through your program. And that's really all that application process is. The individual doesn't have to be a sworn individual, but it has to be an employee of the agency. So if it's fire, they, I mean, they have to be uh, an employee of that agency. Whether or not it be reserve or full-time, I don't care. But the the sign the the letter and the agreement has to come from you know the most upper three, so it is actually agreed upon by the agency that this is what's going to happen. I give them the information as to what they're going to need. You know, there's there's things that you have to go by. There's a contract that they sign with me that basically just states that you can't give the dog away, you can't dump it off at the shelter if you don't want the dog. I get first right of refusal. And so that is how um, that's how that process works. And all they have to do is reach out to me if they want information on having to put together. It's a um, presentation maybe to their supervisor, then reach out to me and I will send them everything that I have. We've got several of our guys that have put together uh, PowerPoint presentations that talk about the process. Then um, I will more than willing. Uh, give them out phone numbers to some of the handlers and they can talk to them about, you know, what they did specifically. Um, because where do they find you guys? Where do they, where do they get in touch with you? The website is caninesforfreedom.org. And uh, my email address is Janine, my first name at caninesforfreedom.org. You better um, spell Janine because there's a few different ways to spell Janine and yours exactly. is one that I don't see very often. Yes. So it's uh, John, Adam, Nora, Edward, Edward, Nora, at K9, K, King, Nine, Sam, Frank, Ocean, Robert, Frank, Robert, Edward, Edward, David, Ocean, Mary, dot org. It's so interesting how everybody's phonetic alphabets are different. I know it's, well, it's like 10 codes. They're completely different too, depending on where you're at. So true. Yeah. What kind of people typically make good candidates for to become a handler and and adopt a dog and and put them into service where they are working. It's got to be someone with a passion for this work. I mean, you've got to be someone who is not just the, you know, thump them and arrest them kind of person, you know. It's it's got to be someone who's got that compassion, who's got 
um, the the want to be a dog handler that likes dogs, that likes people, that likes to talk, that likes to go and do community events, because this is another face to law enforcement. This is supposed to be, I'm approachable. And so is my dog, whether or not it's, again, coffee with a cop, maybe that's a, a fundraiser, maybe it's uh, going to school events. We, we've got a um, couple of our guys, one in particular is an actual SRO, and his dog goes to school with him every day. It's going to the schools, it's willing to talk to whatever age. If you you know really want to get rolling, then it's going to some of the senior centers and, and talking to them and the community centers and you know going out and doing that kind of stuff. So um, this can be a huge thing in regards to popularity and positivity on the department side, because they're doing goofy stuff all the time, whether or not it's putting on costumes for different holidays and saying, you know, Canine Haven wishes everyone a, a Merry Christmas or, you know, Valentine's Day, somebody's doing a kissing booth with one of their dogs, you know, so there's, there's all these different things that can be done that shows that positive side, that human side, because everyone forgets that we're human. We make mistakes. I make mistakes. At the end of the day, we all bleed red, period. I sometimes say I bleed blue, just so we're clear. Well, OK. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's obviously a metaphor yes. uh, for how I feel about law enforcement. Exactly. Dedicated my life to it. You know, I, I have obviously other things in my life as far as being a father and, and yeah. a friend and, a, and family. But, but, you know, other than that, I, I believe this wasn't just an opportunity for me doing the work that I'm doing. Uh, personally, it was just an opportunity for somebody to uh, step up and try to fix things right? the best I can. And, and why I say that is because it's very clear that you are on the same path. Yes. And typically it is very common for other people to be on this podcast and very quickly, it becomes clear that we are brought together for a reason to try to make things better. And, and my hat's off to you. It's really, it's a very, very interesting thing. I think it's very good. Um, I will do anything I can to support you guys in your mission. If you ever have a purpose and you want to continue to push the progression of your your organization, I'd be glad to support you. Uh, yeah, I think absolutely. it's a great, I th yeah, I think it's a great thing. I, and I, I can't thank you enough for being here and explaining this because I've got a funny feeling you're going to have a lot of interest coming your way. And what I want to urge people to do is even if you can't get a dog and you want to help Janine, help her. She could probably use the help. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's it's basically working two full-time jobs. So Yeah, I know. So, you know, like, oh, well, they're not going to let us get a dog, but I really believe in this thing. Yeah, then call up and ask Janine, hey, what can I do to help you? Hey, you could do this. Right. This is a oh, good yeah. thing for us. Do people, do you guys accept donations as well? Absolutely. The, Where there's do you a accept place on the website. Yeah, there's a place on the website that donate. Um, you know, that's that's typically the biggest uh the biggest place for electronic. You know, for those that still like to write checks, which that's fine too. Um, we've got our P.O. box that we take mail at. So it just depends on on how how you want to do that. We're actually doing some work this year. We actually did some work with um, one of the child trafficking centers, helping them out with one of their dogs. And so they they made a, a donation to our organization. So that was, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm willing to help no matter what, but uh, that was very surprising and and happily uh, accepted. Uh, let's put it that way. It's It's been fantastic to to see how only a few years ago when I was trying to get this rolling and you you know, you go to some of these, I went to several canine associations uh, years ago and said, Hey, this is what I want to see doing, you know, us doing. Can you help me? And you basically get the, no, that's stupid, you know, kind of stuff. And so I finally got to an association, which is ARI Alliance of Emergency Response Instructor and Examiners. And they're like, hell yeah, we'll help you. Now, all of a sudden, you see a couple of these other organizations thinking, oh, well, I guess we should jump on the bandwagon. And it's like, well, you know, unfortunately for you guys, I had the first national standard, the first national certification. And, you know, it's it, I'm glad you're on board now. But, you know, I needed your help a few years ago. But anyway, resiliency. Got to do it. Tenacity. Oh yeah, uh, all those things, and and it's worth it. And people don't realize that it is worth it. So yeah, um, it was a pleasure connecting with you. And reach out anytime you want. Anytime I can support you. Thank and you, guys, thank you. help Janine and uh, Canines for Freedom. 
This is really cool. And I'm pumped that you were here today. This is great. No, absolutely. Hopefully when I bring uh, uh, Monroe County's dog out, we can uh, we can hook up. Yeah, let me know. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Thank Janine. you, Dennis. Can I, I get... so appreciate it. Yeah, I'll see you. All right, take care. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher, so you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.